Okay, hello and welcome back. At the time of recording, I released the video on gender and noun classes just a few days ago, and now I thought I'd go ahead and squeeze in just one case study video before I shut myself away and do absolutely nothing except work on alien biospheres for the next month. Which, by the way, every time I release one of these Conlang case study videos, there's always a contingent of people that come and comment on them just to ask when the next episode of Alien Biospheres will be. I always assumed this was just kind of obvious, but to those people who keep asking, I make an episode of Alien Biospheres every two months. I make a video on conlanging, and then I make an Alien Biospheres episode. Then I make another video on conlanging, and then I make another Alien Biospheres episode, and lather, rinse, repeat. Plus a few conlang case study episodes sprinkled in there because these are very quick and easy to make. That is the way I've always done it, and that is the way I will always continue to do it. And no, I'm not going to make them any faster, no matter how many times you ask, simply because if I did, I would literally die of exhaustion. I already desperately struggle to meet my own self-imposed deadlines, and I have already made myself sick from overworking several times now. And I don't mean like, oh, I didn't really feel very well afterwards. I mean, I actually was, like, bedridden for a while because I stayed up working on an Alien Biospheres episode for 43 hours straight and worked myself into a fever. Now, fortunately, something like that shouldn't ever happen again because now that I'm full-time, I've got an extra 40 or so hours every week to devote to video production. So now I can afford to get at least some sleep every night. But the fact of the matter is that making a 40 minute long homemade nature documentary kinda takes a while. And although I do enjoy making them, they still require an enormous amount of time and effort and stress to make. And it would simply be physically impossible for me to make them any faster than I already do. Hmm, that turned into a bit of a rant. Sorry about that. But I do get at least... 20 to 30 comments every day just asking about when the next Alien Biospheres episode is going to be. And to be honest, it does get quite irritating sometimes. But anyway, enough about that. Let's get back to the conlanging. So for today's patron shout-out, I'd like to give an extra special thanks to Adam Price, because you may recall in the last episode, or maybe it was the episode before that, I can't remember, I mentioned how I have never really used sound change appliers because I am so technologically illiterate, I couldn't program a stopwatch. But after that episode, a bunch of people told me to look into Lexigy, which is a sound change applier made by Graham Hill, who oddly enough was my first patron ever. You'll see that the Nakashti Showcase video is dedicated exclusively to him, and he's also one of the only two patrons that I've ever met in person as well. But anyway, he made this sound change applier, which had been recommended to me by a lot of people, and I had seen being used by David Peterson and Jesse Sams in their series. So I gave it a look, and as I suspected, I managed to mightily confuse myself. I'm still in the process of familiarizing myself with exactly how it works, and hopefully I will learn to use it properly myself at some point. But I was chatting with some of the patrons on Discord about this, and it was after a long back and forth with Adam Price that we were finally able to produce this. Behold, we have sound changes. So thanks to Adam's help, I will no longer have to do everything manually, which should speed things up significantly. It was actually kind of an interesting process because I know the way I write sound changes, they're not very well defined, but I'm so used to doing this that I know what I mean when I write a sound change, but that's not necessarily going to be obvious to other people or to a computer program. So it was actually really difficult to properly specify what each of the rules exactly did and what all of their exceptions were, so armed with the sound changes, let's pick up where we left off. So last time we had just 
essentially finished making all of these auxiliary forms. And I did say at the end of that last episode that I would doubtlessly spot errors and problems and change my mind about certain things, and I was right. First of all, this Uri form, I forgot to apply word final vowel loss, should just be Ur. Also, for the sake of completeness, this form, Ohan, even though we're probably not going to use it, should harmonize to Ohon. And I said last time that if we were strictly following the pattern that we use with some of the other auxiliaries, there should be Rin, with a long I. But after thinking about it some more, I think we can get away with turning it into Ran, which I think sounds better, and it helps it more obviously contrast with Rin, with a short I. Also with this form, I forgot that the final I would front the A, so it would ultimately become Ver. Also over here in the dative case for the inanimate, I did the same mistake that I always do and forgot that when word final vowels are lost, that RS cluster that would result would be broken up. So it wouldn't be URA, it would be URAS. Now I was also thinking about these suppletive forms and whether or not I liked them. I think this RE form does do a pretty good job of getting rid of the bad ones that I don't like for this auxiliary. But this SU form, I don't know, I just really want some more variety in these forms. So I was thinking, what if we tried out KU and also KU with a long vowel? Because I can see both of those working. I know the entire point of using the SU auxiliary was so that we would get more fronted vowels, but that's fine, I'll, I'll live if that's not the case. I mean, it doesn't really net us that many more fronted vowels. Okay, yeah, that worked even better than I had hoped it would. The only forms from either of them that I think are just irredeemably bad are these two, Nidakle and Suvakle. But fortunately for us, those forms for the original auxiliary are the ones that we really wanted to keep anyway. So that works out pretty well. I think I'm leaning towards the Ku form, because I like Kaskle. Once again, I keep forgetting that there's no U. So comparing these forms to these forms, these are the ones that I like significantly better than the original forms. Tiskle I can take or leave, but it does have that nice SQ cluster in there. I feel like I've already gone back and forth about this before, but... This Taka auxiliary, I think I'm going to change that to Taka, because I slightly prefer the word final K to word final Q, and it gives us that alternation between the K and the Q that we were looking for. Okay, before I go ahead and just go with this auxiliary, I think we need to consider exactly how the suppletion manifests. Like, where is the split between the different forms? Because we've already decided what these person markers correspond to, because we need those for the case system. But the question is, what are these forms? And do these suppletive forms supplete for anything in particular? Well, if we were to go with this tiskle, that would be the form for the animate plural. So immediately I think maybe this hu auxiliary is suppletive for number that hahan was only used for singular subjects, and ku was used for plural subjects. And if that's the case, then that means that all four of these need to be plural, which, very fortunately, we have exactly four plural categories left. So they could, for example, be something like that, which means that these two forms, the only persons left are the first person singular and the second person singular. I also like that because, for reasons that I still don't really understand, the ni syllable tends to very commonly occur as a singular pronoun in a lot of languages. Like in all three of my top three favorite languages, in Nahuatl and Swahili it's the first person singular, and in Navajo it's the second person singular. So I like how that kind of coincidentally lines up with that. So does that work then with this auxiliary? Well, that would mean that these are both the first person singular and the second person singular. 
And then the other one would be the human singular. Wow, that does actually work. And for this one, which we said we could take or leave, that's the animate singular. Wow, that actually lines up amazingly well. And the only singular that doesn't follow that pattern would be the inanimate, but the inanimate doesn't differentiate between singular and plural in the first place. And it's inanimate, so it'll usually be disfavored as a subject. So that makes perfect sense to me. Man, that is incredibly felicitous. Okay, well, I guess that takes care of that. I'm officially promoting who to the status of suppletive auxiliary. This is my last chance to make sure I like this layout. Yeah, I think I'm going to stick with that. And voila! We have proto-pronouns. And that means we can now officially tabulate these forms in the modern language. The only thing left to decide is which one of these is the copula and which one is the locative copula. So this is our tense aspect matrix thing up here. So I reckon the tense aspects that will be used most frequently, the perfect, the present, the imperfect, and maybe the future. So basically, the short stem for the copula, the non-reduplicated form of the regular copula, will be the most commonly used. So essentially, which of these columns do I like the best? It would have to be one of the short stems. I mean, Arhan is in this column, and Arhan is probably my favorite form out of all of these. And it's the human plural, so that means it's going to be used pretty often as well, which is great. And if that was the case, then that too would just match what we already had. This is weird. Everything is working out weirdly perfectly. I'm not used to this. So it's the perfect form that's the one that's formed with reduplication. So in the protolang, the imperfective or the simple copula would be a han, and then the perfective would be reduplicated to ha han. But then you've got this ku form, which is just used for plural subjects in the perfective. So I think we had said way, way, way back in the day that the standard copula evolved from a verb that meant something like to live. So saying something like, it is big, would literally be it lives big. And then the word live just gets semantically bleached over time until it turns into the copula. And like with all verbs, when you reduplicate that in the proto-language, it has a perfect or like a completed connotation to it. So it live live big means it was big. Something along those lines. But then this would be an entirely different verb root that's just used for when the subject is plural. And it's also exclusively for the perfective, so it would maybe already have some sort of past tenseness baked into it. So I'm thinking something like stay. So they stay big kind of implies they used to be big, and they're still big. And then the locative copula in the imperfective is this akya root, which I think we said would come from stand, or sit, or something similar. It almost doesn't matter. And then the perfective is just the reduplicated form of that. But now we have another suppletive form, except this time it's just for the singular. So we need a verb that means basically the same thing as stand, except it applies to, or it is associated more with singularness. And once again, it would help, although it wouldn't be totally necessary, if it had some sort of perfective sense already baked into it. What if the suppletive form was actually stand? And what if we made the regular locative copula, what if we made it more of an existential kind of thing? What if it was just like, to exist? That makes sense to me. With suppletion like this, often the verb roots that you choose can kind of be somewhat arbitrary, or they may even just be completely synonymous and just they get conflated just by the fact that they mean basically the same thing. Like the case with um, go and went in English, where I think it was wend that used to mean the same thing as go, I think. 
And again, suppletion is never particularly common, but if it's going to show up anywhere, it's going to be in the copula. Because the copula is almost guaranteed to be irregular. Go ahead and add those to our dictionary. I don't think any of these forms will actually survive into the modern day beyond just the auxiliary forms. So we don't need to worry about applying sound changes and bringing them into the modern language. But they may still surface in various other places depending on exactly how I do certain derivational things. And while I'm at it, I remember down here in the imperative. We said the imperative was formed from the fusion of the second person pronouns with the verb root. And it's the only verb form that does not require an auxiliary. And now we know what our second person pronouns are. So let's grab those. Now if these pronouns are going to merge with verb roots, do we want them to be prefixes or suffixes? Because I could see both being possible. Because if I remember correctly, I can't actually, there it is. So the protolang was SOV, but then once the auxiliary constructions evolved, the auxiliaries got shunted forward, and it ended up being essentially V2. So the second person pronouns would be the subject of the verb. So we might expect them to appear in subject position relative to the verb, which would mean they would come before the verb, which means they would evolve into prefixes. Or we could equally say that these pronouns, instead of being used in a true subject kind of way, they could be used in a vocative sort of way and put after the verb, which would also sort of put the focus on the verb itself. It's kind of like in English, if you say something like, quiet you, or something like that, where you put you after the verb, I think I'm going to go with suffixes. Because if we go with prefixes, then I don't imagine this one getting reduced very much, because that B, there's not very much vowel loss that happens between voiced stops and other sounds. So it'd pretty much always just be a sub or suva prefix, which seems a little bit clunky. We could probably find some way to justify reducing it further. But in the imperative, we've also still got the reduplication for the perfect that survives from the old language, which is effectively a prefix. And plus, as a suffix, that s there would be in prime position for metathesis and or rotisization and all the other funky stuff that happens to it. So we'll tentatively say that they're suffixes, but we'll figure out exact forms for them a bit later. And the other thing we can do now is to actually formalize our case system. Okay, so I think this is what our case table will look like. Now I've just got to port over all of this stuff. It just now occurs to me that maybe if we wanted to be sneaky, sometimes inanimate nouns get treated differently when applying case marking, especially when it comes to the accusative. Because if you think about it, you kind of expect inanimate nouns to be the object. So in some languages, if the direct object is inanimate, you won't need to apply the accusative. So maybe in this language, the accusative case marker never became associated with the inanimates, which means that the nominative and the accusative for the inanimate would be identical. I'm going to write that down and come back to that. Okay, so those are all the forms that we had worked out to make sure the inverse number system worked, which if we look at these forms for the animate and inanimate, and even these ones as well, I think that's worked out pretty well. We'll think about the dual another time, because that's a separate innovation that comes later on. But let me just go ahead and fill in the human plural. So taking the agar protoform and applying the various case suffixes. Okay, so overall that is looking pretty solid. Now the specific realizations for each of these forms is liable to change depending on the phonology of the stem. And that's what's going to give us different declensions. But for now, this is the sort of 
prototypical pattern that we would expect. So now we've got case marking, we've got our auxiliaries, we've got our imperatives to think about, and the case markers also give us these three converb forms. So we've got a lot of the essential components of grammar in place now. I think that's a pretty good place to call it for today. But in the next episode, it looks like we might finally get around to actually creating some words and some test sentences. Yes, it's the moment you've been waiting for. It only took me about 14 months, but we're finally going to get our first word. So look forward to that, and I hope to see you there. See you next time.